This is Research Like a Pro, episode 213, Five Takeaways from an Advanced DNA Course. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogist professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the authors of Research Like a Pro, a genealogist guide. With Robin Worthland, they also co-authored the companion volume, Research Like a Pro with DNA. Join Diana and Nicole as they discuss how to stay organized, make progress in their research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Hi, how are you today? Hi, Nicole. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm excited. We're getting ready for our next Research Like a Pro study group that's happening this fall. I am too. I've been trying to think of what project I want to use for that. That's always fun to do your own project. And I have so many doing some thinking. I kind of want to do something that gets prepared for the DNA study group in the spring so I can do the really good documentary research and then add on DNA for a second phase. Absolutely. You probably have a lot of good future research suggestions from your recent Dillard project. I do. And I also have this Mary Clumsy Klein hanging out as a brick wall ancestor on my tree that I'm also curious about. So I'm kind of going back and forth. Do I continue with Cynthia Dillard or do I just jump to something new? So I will keep thinking. Mary Clumsy Klein. Don't we have mitochondrial DNA for her line? Yes, I just got that from my cousin. So I'm I'm actually really kind of interested in that. The challenge is that, you know, with mitochondrial testing, you've got to have a good testing subject to test your hypothesis. So I've got to do some targeted testing. So it might be really good to do a foundational project so I can trace some descendants of my hypothesized father and then have them test in preparation for the DNA study group. Hey, that's a great idea. I think I might want to do that one now that we're talking about it. (laughs) Yeah, but I don't want you to leave behind the Dillards because you did make good progress on that too. I know, I know. Well, I found Elijah Dillard as a very possible, a probable brother to Cynthia. So yeah, it is kind of, you know, challenging. Which one do I want to do? I will look at both of them and really think through what would be (laughs) fun to do this time. (laughs) Well, fun. So by way of announcements, of course, we said the study group is beginning this fall and registration is ongoing currently. The registration ends at the end of August, so if you're thinking about joining us for the study group, please sign up. Just so you know, the schedule for the Research Like a Pro study group this fall is that it will begin on Wednesday, September 7th, and we will meet every week for nine weeks, but we will have a break for the week of October 19th to give you an extra week just to do all of your research and follow your research plan. We always have two weeks to write the report, and the second week is a lesson on adding in things about copyright, plagiarism, proof, just continuing to think about writing. So there's two weeks for research and two weeks for writing, which I think is helpful. Yes, I'm really glad we added that extra week. And you know, we take feedback after every single study group and really listen to what our peer group leaders and our class members have to say and try to incorporate that. And so that was one of the huge request was we need more time to write and we need more time to research. So we're excited to have that built into the study group. Absolutely. Well, we have a listener spotlight review to read. And this listener says the hosts are very good at discussing the topics, which they tend to break down into small chunks of knowledge. Delightful to listen to this mother daughter team. Excellent source for learning how to become a professional and what you need to do to prepare. So thank you so much to that listener. We appreciate that. And that is one of our goals is to always make things accessible and take hard concepts and break those down for you, which is what we're going to do today because we're going to be talking about my advanced DNA course that I took recently from the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh. And this course was coordinated by Blaine Bettinger, who is a notable expert in the field and probably my very favorite DNA teacher because of his ability to break down difficult concepts and make them easy. So I'm excited to talk about some of the things I learned and 
you know, obviously we had hours and hours of learning, and so we're not going to cover it all in this podcast episode, but just kind of the major things that were my takeaways that I really learned. Yeah, I wish I could have come. Did you have a lot of people in the class? We had about 60. So yeah, that's a good amount. And we had a case study that we followed all week. We had homework and Blaine gave us a little piece of it to do each day. And so that was fun because, you know, you always learn a lot as you're doing the actual work and research and applying what you learn. And so that was fun. Very cool. Let's just dive into your first takeaway. What was the first thing that you learned about that you really were excited to hear about? Well, Blaine had warned us that this class would be heavy on the science. And I wasn't sure if I should be worried about that or excited about that and kind of a little bit of both. But I should have known that he would break that science down and really make it understandable. You know, the companies all have their white papers, which is their scientific paper. And those aren't always the easiest to understand from a lay person's point of view. And so even though I have read many of those and studied those and used those and looked at those, sometimes it just doesn't stick. So I really appreciated this course because as he was teaching, so many of the things clicked into place, things that we've read or studied in the past. And you know how you just have to hear things over and over sometimes to really get them to click? And that's kind of what happened with a lot of these concepts. So the very first class we had was on why DNA testing at Family Tree DNA. And that was so good because we talked a lot about the big Y700 DNA test. And we have a lot of clients who have taken that big Y700 and want to know what it means and how they can use it. That comes up in our DNA study group all the time. And I think it is confusing. How does that big Y700 compare to, first of all, the big Y500 used to be offered, or even just the tests at 37 or 111 markers, the STR tests. I know you have used the big Y700 with your Dyer project, right? Right. I was hopeful it would be really helpful. The thing we need is just more people from the Dyer branch that my father-in-law's on to test to make it more useful. So recently got a 111 match, which was so exciting. And so I don't know, I might ask him to upgrade right now. I'm just doing his genealogy. So that is really exciting. Well, and that's one of the things we learned. So I'm going to back up just a little bit before we get to that and give our listeners just a little bit of clarification and background on this, because this is something that I think everybody gets confused on. So with the Y DNA to get really simple and clear. It only is passed, the Y chromosome is only passed down through the male line. So you have father, son, father, son all along the way. The DNA tests the Y chromosome. If you've heard somebody say they've tested at 37 or 67 used to be a test you could take or 111 markers, that means that they are looking at the STRs, which is short tandem repeats. And sometimes you hear people call those the stutters. And that is being compared using a chip and they're looking for all the differences between the test takers Y chromosome and the standard chip. And then they're comparing that to everybody else that's taken the test and then you get to see who you compare to. So it's basically just the compare test. Then they decided they were going to do a sequencing test where they are looking at the whole chromosome and they were using the big Y500 and looking at 500 places, and this time they're using SNPs. That stands for single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is why we just call them SNPs. So the big Y700 was a big upgrade from the previous big Y500, and this one actually discovers new SNPs through that sequencing, and like you were saying, puts you on the Y DNA haplogroup family tree. So if you have got like a father or a son or an uncle or a cousin who could also do the big Y700, you'll be able to see your family group on the Y DNA haplogroup family tree. You'll have a very unique haplogroup with a bunch of letters and numbers, and you'll have your own little place on the tree. So it was interesting to learn 
more about what you can do with that. So if you don't have any good matches at 111 markers, the Big Y700 won't give you any more matches. So people often want to say, well, should I upgrade? And not necessarily, you know, you might want to just reach out and get some targeted testers and see how they compare to you at 111 and then could go forward with the Big Y700. That's a great explanation of how to know if you're ready to use the Big Y700 test. So for people who are thinking about doing a Y-DNA test, tell us a little bit more about what is a good testing strategy. All right. So Blaine gave us such a good analogy for comparing the tests. The Y37 test only compares your DNA across 37 of those STRs on the Y chromosome. So he compared that to an old black and white TV that is grainy and doesn't give a great picture. So anybody who is as young as you, Nicole, probably doesn't even know what that's like. But, you know, sometimes in movies you'll see the old black and white TVs. Pretty bad picture. Then the Y11, 111 test compares the DNA across 111, which is a lot more of those STRs and can be compared to a nice color TV with a clear picture. You know, this is what we had before our high definition TVs came across. And I remember getting our first color TV and just being so amazed. It was so awesome. I was really little, but I remember how great it was. And then the Big Y 700 compares across 700 STRs and is like high definition TV with incredible clarity. So that's amazing, you know, just how much more it compares. So that's why if you've got someone who's tested at 111 and they haven't done the Big Y 700, they're just going to compare across the 111. But if they do the Big Y 700, you can compare across 700. Anyway, it is a good idea to just start with 37 or 111 and then move to the big Y if that looks to be promising. So just remember it's best for testing hypotheses, not to go fishing for DNA matches. So if you have researched an ancestor and you think he belongs to your family, trace his known male descendants, find a candidate for targeted testing and have him test. And you can always start with 30 Y37, that's the least expensive test, and then you can upgrade if you decide that you want to do more and more testing. That in a nutshell is what we got. And of course in our class we talked a lot about the the block tree and interpreting everything on that and you can actually read it all in the big Y700 white paper that Family Tree DNA puts out. Oh, they have a white paper? How did I not know that? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it's not obvious. I don't know. But my blog post has a link to it. <laughs> Thank you. And Blaine has a really good blog post, too. And I have a link to that in the blog post. We could put that in the show notes where it's called Thinking About a Big Y Test at Family Tree DNA, where he goes into a lot of how to interpret it and the results and what you're looking at. Yeah, I just clicked onto the Big Y700 white paper and I'm excited because I just feel like it helps to understand a little more about what you're doing when you do those tests. And I paid for this one before I really knew anything about it. Just thought I would do it (laughs) just to learn about it. And so still learning. Well, and that's the thing. And, And Blaine said that too, that we're all still learning and the companies keep upgrading and changing. And so you know, what may have been true a year ago may not be true today. And so just like in all of our genealogy, we're continually learning. But I think with DNA, the learning curve is much higher (laughs) because we're really, they're just discovering new ways to analyze the DNA. Well, that was a good takeaway. So what's your next takeaway? Okay. And this one came up several times throughout the week and it is to be wary of small segments. And I really appreciated this because we see this so much in the genetic genealogy world where people are so excited because they share a match with someone and it completely confirms their hypothesis of a common ancestor, but then the match is only eight centimorgans and it's really small. And even if it's a triangulated match, a segment match with someone else, that could be going back to a very distant relative, you know, population segment and not be a common ancestor. So it's something we all need to be aware of. So, you know, a small shared segment generally 
I mean, for sure under 10 centimorgans, but even under 20, we could have something that might not go back to a recent common ancestor. So there's two terms that come up all the time that um, you might have heard of, and one is IBS, or identical by state, and the other is IBD, identical by descent. And the ISOC wiki gives really good definitions. So if you haven't heard of the ISOC wiki or don't know about that, it's the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. And you can go there and put in any term and get a definition and explanation, links to posts, articles. It's really, really a good place to get information. So let me just give you the definition of these terms. Quote, in genetic genealogy, the term IBS is generally used to describe segments which are not identical by descent and therefore do not share a recent common ancestor. IBS is also used in genetic genealogy to describe small IBD segments which are shared by many people both within and between populations in which have no genealogical relevance. So, you know, it's just important to know if we're looking at a segment that's relatively small, it may not come from our fourth great grandfather like we had hoped. You know, we might be receiving that from an ancestor much further back or a population segment that everybody in the population shared. And this, you know, of course occurs in populations that share a lot of DNA like endogamous populations, which we'll talk about in a minute. So one of the, the scientific things that we learned, because remember this course was all about the science, and we looked at the family uh, tree DNA matching 5.0 white paper. And that had a table that showed the increasing danger of false positives, segments that are IBS. So those segments that don't, you don't inherit from a common ancestor. And it was really interesting to see this table and they showed as soon as you got less than six centimorgans, that percentage of segments increases exponentially. It went up to like something like 99% of them were just population segments or very, very old segments. So, you know, that's why each company does have a threshold to maximize the IBD segment. You know, they try to minimize those IBS segments and try to make it so that we get a good balance of matches but then taking out the false matches or false positives. So, you know, my takeaway was those thresholds are not perfect. So we have to do our own analysis. We've got to really be careful. And if we're trying to use small segments, we use a lot of DNA test takers. We try to get a big network of people rather than just two or three. That's a good way to mitigate those small segments. Another ha thought I had was when you're talking about, you know, as the size decreases, the higher the chance it is that it's IBS, identical by state. And I was wondering, do they just happen to be the same sequence because of chance and not necessarily like a false match, but the smaller you go, the higher the chances that you might just have the same sequence with people there? Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Because it says um, they could have no genealogical relevance. You didn't inherit it from a common ancestor for several reasons. Maybe it, it just happens to be the same sequence there, or it's a false match where it, where it weaves back and forth. Right. And we did talk about that idea of phasing. If you can get your DNA phase so that they kind of know these the segments from your either father or mother and have those divided up, that does make it a little bit better, well, actually quite a bit better for the the truly false positives, you know, the segments where it's just weaving back and forth. So yeah, there's just a lot to think about with the small segments and you have to be careful. Thanks for that. That's a really a good reminder. Tell us some more about what you guys talked about as far as the shared Centimorgan project, since that's Blaine's project. Well, this was really fun and we use the shared Centimorgan project all the time. That's our key thing in taking the amount of DNA that we match with someone, putting it in there, getting the possible relationships. And so we did spend some good time learning about that and the science behind it, which was great. So for any of you listening that are new, you can find this shared Centimorgan project tool on the DNA Painter website. It's completely free to use. Johnny Pearl hosts it on his website. And 
what you can do is once you put in the amount of DNA you share, you will be able to see the different types of relationships. And then you can just click on the relationship that you think is your hypothesis for how you connect to that person. And you can see where that falls on the histogram. So when I say histogram, just think of a bar graph and it's showing the distribution of shared DNA for a reported re relationship. Blaine had 60,000 people approximately send in how much DNA they shared with their first cousin and their first cousin once removed and their second cousin and their second cousin once removed. So it was a crowdsourced project where people said this is how much I share and because DNA is inherited randomly you get different types of relationships for different amounts of DNA that is shared but when you put it all together you get to see where you know most people fell in that and so the histogram clearly shows that graph so for instance in the first cousin once removed you have a really high bar for 500 centimorgans being the amount of DNA shared for the first cousin once removed. There were almost 1,200 people that reported that relationship. So that's a lot, you know, that's pretty good. But then you've got clear out on the shoulders of that. You've got nine people that reported 1,000 centimorgans. Okay, so that's like twice as much as most people did. And then on the opposite end, you've got 97 people that reported only 200. So he said to be aware of those outliers, that amount of DNA shared by that relationship. If, if it's way out there on the far right or the far left, you need to really make sure that it's a true outlier or could the relationship be different? And he said, especially be wary if it is higher than it should be because that could be pointing to a different relationship or maybe two shared ancestors. And we've seen this in, in our DNA. We've got some cousins that married and we share through both of their lines. And so those DNA descendants share a little bit more with us than you would think for our relationship. So just again, analyzing, not taking it for granted that you are right, being sure that you're really examining every scenario. Yeah, it's a good idea to just test out different ideas and see which one could be right, like you said. Because how many times have people made erroneous conclusions because they just didn't look into it very close? Right, and it's so easy to see those histograms just by clicking on the relationships and comparing. You know, if you're right there in the middle, then you're like, oh, okay, that's, that's pretty good. But if you're on the outside parts, take a closer look. And of course, there's going to be outliers. That's the way it is. You know, we did share, we do inherit different amounts of DNA, but we just want to be careful. All right. Well, that was a good takeaway. What's your next takeaway? Well, this is another one that we talked about a lot, and that was realizing the danger of confirmation bias. So this was a course on science and genetic genealogy is based on science. So we need to use the scientific method of trying in every way possible to disprove our hypothesis. And if we can't disprove it, we can conclude that the hypothesis is confirmed. So how often do we want it to match, to work out? You know, we found this hypothesized ancestor and in through lines shows we have some matches. We're like, oh yay, I did it right. But there's so much more that we need to do to try to disprove that hypothesis before we can actually conclude it's confirmed. So we have to be careful. And so there are some things we talked about how we can avoid confirmation bias and test our hypotheses. And the first thing is to check the size of the segment, just what we were talking about. So if we're avoiding those small segments, that is really a good thing to do to make sure that we're really sharing a recent common ancestor and not common ancestry from hundreds of years ago. Yeah, I wonder how many times we find a match and think that the relationship is closer and we search through the trees and we just can't find any relationship. <laughs> no common ancestors. And then, aha, perhaps they're related so far back that we're not going to find it. Oh, yes, and that has happened to all of us. 
<laughs> it's disappointing, but it, it is a fact. We just have to realize that. So the next part of that confirmation bias, making sure we're not doing that, is to ask, does the proposed relationship and amount of shared DNA make sense? And just as I was talking about the Shared Center Morgan Project, we have to see if the relationship we've hypothesized works. Is If it's larger than the maximum, we look more closely, see if there was a different relationship or more than one way we are related. And if it's smaller, we can go back to our analysis and decide if we were correct. You know, so many of these things are simple. They seem simple, but you need to do the work. All right, so the final part of confirmation bias that we'll just talk about today in this podcast is this idea of tree completeness. So I've said a couple times we might share DNA with a match on more than one line. And if we don't know how complete our matches tree is, and if we don't know how complete our tree is, then we don't know if we're going to share on more than one line. So we always need to assume the possibility that we share in a different line than we've hypothesized. So it may be we only share with one ancestor, but maybe it's a different ancestor than we thought. And so we have to be really careful that we have as complete a tree or be aware if our tree is not complete. And the same with our DNA matches. And this is tricky because on ancestry, we often have matches who, they're, who have a very small tree with maybe four people or 20 people. You know, even if it's like 100 people, that's not a very big tree. So we have to be careful and look at the trees. Yes, that's so true. And I had so many thoughts when you were talking about this. And one of them is that Sometimes people have a seemingly large amount of people in their tree, but then when you look at it, it's like only on the father's side and the whole mother's side is missing. Yeah. And you're like, oh, well, <laughs> we probably share an ancestor on the side that's missing then because <laughs> <That's a big laughs> I don't see problem. anyone on the other side. And then another thing is that usually we can tell through shared matches which line it's on, but we can't tell that from just looking at their tree. Like sometimes if a, a match seems really important, I'll ask them to, to really look at their shared matches and say, well, what side of the family does it look like it's on for you? Because unless they share their DNA matches with you, you can't see their shared matches for the match with you. Right. Anyways, so it's helpful to ask that, you know, come at it from their direction too when you're figuring that match out. And tree completeness, I think, encompasses the idea of tree accuracy for your match and yourself. Because if the match's tree is inaccurate or they have a an NPE on their tree, it can make it really difficult to find the common ancestor. And so many times that is the problem that we see, especially with our client projects, because the clients are coming to us because they can't figure it out. There's something wrong there. And we, we chart it out. We do all this analysis and then discover, yep, there was another, not the parent expected. There was another event, another adoption, or, you know, something, whatever the case was that makes it tricky. So so many scenarios that come up in DNA. Right. And we have to consider all of them. And I think that's what this takeaway is about, that sometimes we come up with the hypothesis of, oh, you know, this is the common ancestor, or this is why I can't find the common ancestor. And then we're just wrong. But because we had that idea, then everything we see confirms that bias. And I just love the idea that this is a hypothesis we're coming up with. And coming at it from the perspective of trying to disprove it rather than trying to prove it because we can just clutch on to those hypotheses and want them to be true <laughs> so much that we let things blind us. So put on your science hat and I think that will help us a lot with our DNA work. Yeah. I think it's good to not just come up with one hypothesis, but to think of all the different things that could be explaining what you're seeing. And then, like you said, go through them one by one and try to disprove each one. Yeah. All right. Well, our final takeaway that we'll talk about today is on understanding endogamy, pedigree collapse, and multiple relationships. And I was so glad that we had a class session to talk about this. Actually, it came up a few times, but we had one session where we really focused on this one. It was so good because this comes up in our DNA study group too all the time, where people are looking at their DNA results or they do the leads chart and it looks like they've got all this pedigree collapse or endogamy and they're not understanding what they're seeing. And so I really appreciated getting some clarity on this. 
So endogamy, we can define as marrying or reproducing with, within the same population for hundreds of years or multiple generations. And usually we see this in cultural or religious populations such as Ashkenazi Jewish populations or the Amish population, you know, for cultural or religions that share and they've just married for hundreds of years together. Or it could be for a geographic reason, such as a population that's been isolated on islands for, again, hundreds of years, reproducing within the same population. And so, you know, we've seen this in many of our projects with ancestry from the islands, you know, Polynesia, any of the islands in Tonga, or Samoa, or Hawaii. And so that is endogamy and it affects our genetic genealogy because people will share many of those small IBD or population segments are very old. So remember IBD is identical by descent. So they are segments that you maybe, you know, got from an ancestor, but they're just so old and everybody gets the same segment. And so the total amount of shared DNA will be inflated as a result and your match may look like they are much closer than is actual, which is really difficult with endogamy. And we talked about some solutions, which I won't really get into, but you know, the major one is to use larger segments. Don't use those small segments, really look at the larger segments. It's so helpful that Ancestry helps us figure out how many segments there are and the largest segment now, because that helps with endogamy. It really does. And so you can sort your matches by that. Try to find people who are related more recent, not this very, very far back. So it's just something to be aware of if you're seeing that in your DNA results or if you know in your history, you know, doing your family history that you are will have one of those populations. So the next one we'll talk about is pedigree collapse. And this occurs when cousins reproduce and a person will have the same set of ancestors in more than one place in the tree. This often gets confused with endogamy and pedigree collapse over many generations can result in endogamy. But just two or three instances in your family tree is not endogamy. That's more pedigree collapse. And this scenario can affect matching to closer matches, but it fades quickly because of segment loss and it won't have a huge effect on downstream matching. And I thought that was really an interesting takeaway because I hadn't thought about that so much. Pedigree collapse, you can usually figure out where it happened, but it's not going to have such a, a large effect. Yeah, in my dire case where I found that two cousins married each other, those descendants all formed a very tight genetic network, but then it, it's true that it doesn't have a huge effect on the matching, I guess, because I don't know, I could just figure it out. They were more distant, I guess. Right. And I think that's the key. You could figure it out. You could see where it happened and it really does affect mostly the descendants. So just because you match to some of those people, it's not going to affect you as much as those descendants who have that in their tree. So if you have got the same set of ancestors in more than one place in your tree, then you have pedigree collapse. But if you don't, if you just have a set of cousins who married, that is what we call multiple relationships. And that's what I was talking about when we discover that we're related to a DNA match through more than one line. So for instance, if you have siblings that marry siblings, the descendants of couple one could share DNA with descendants of couple two through both lines. And it only affects the descendants of those two couples and their shared matching. And then with the loss of segments in each generation, this effect will be reduced. So you'll look for this in fairly recent ancestry. And this happens in our family tree. I've got my great grandparents, Doc Harris, and Alice Frazier and their siblings married each other. So we have a Frazier Harris marriage and then another Frazier Harris marriage through their siblings. And so that's multiple relationships and it's my great grandparents. So I do see matches cause that's fairly recent ancestry that this occurred, but you know, for you, Nicole and your children, and as those generations go through, the amount of shared matching won't really be inflated as much because every generation, some segments are lost. 
So I thought that was really interesting. That was a good way to explain that those are three different scenarios. We just need to look at our trees again and see if we can figure out what is going on. That's a really helpful explanation and all three of those things can affect how we analyze the DNA matches. So it's good to be on the lookout for them, but it's also good, like you said, to understand the differences between them. So we don't misdiagnose our tree as having endogamy when we just have some multiple relationships with DNA matches. That's exactly right. So I was grateful for that because I think that I have been guilty of saying that I've got pedigree collapse in my Southern lines and that could be true, but I have several lines I haven't discovered yet. And so I can't really say that for sure because I don't have a complete tree on that side, on my southern side. So I think I might just have more multiple relationships. Yeah, it's totally possible. Well, thank you for sharing all these great takeaways. If anybody is interested in taking this course, how can they learn more about it? Blaine will be repeating this course next summer and it will be in person in Pittsburgh as part of the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh. You can just go to the website, learn about the specific dates, how to register, and you'll have to travel because it's going to be in person. But I highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in just digging in. I was so glad I was able to take it virtually and maybe it'll be available virtually someday in the future, but next year it's in person. All right. Well, that was a great kind of summary of some of the good things you can learn from taking an advanced DNA Institute course. And there are several out there and we hope that you guys will consider signing up for one if you're ready to take your learning to the next level as far as advanced DNA. Thank you, Diana. And to all our listeners, we hope that you gained a nugget of information from this and can go forward with more confidence in using DNA evidence in your genealogy research. All right. Good luck, everyone. Have a great week. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. If you want to learn more, purchase our books, Research Like a Pro and Research Like a Pro with DNA on amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our online courses or study groups of the same names. Learn more at familylocket.com slash services. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our courses. To get updates in your email inbox each Monday, subscribe to our newsletter at familylocket.com slash newsletter. Please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. We read each review and are so thankful for them. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.